uh, Centre for Rail Excellence. Andy is a fellow of the PWI, the Royal Academy of Engineers, the IET and the IRSE and provides vision and leadership to the technology strategy and development of the UK's first full scale railway innovation facility. Over to you, Andy. OK, hopefully everybody can hear me. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to be able to present to you today um, about uh, actually a new railway that we're building. Um, I shall try and explain to you uh, what we're up to, what we're building, um, why we're building it, where we're building it, all that sort of thing. And then I'm going to go through a bit of technical detail because uh, it is the PWI on sort of, uh, yeah, the more technical details of the, of the plan. Um, and uh, well, well, we'll see how we go. And it clearly, if you can uh, uh, wait till the end, give some uh, questions, that would be great. So without further ado, I'll get started. Um, so first off, uh, GCRE, well, it's a bit of a funny title, isn't it? Global Centre of Rail Excellence. It's really a working title, to be honest with you. Um, but um, things have been moving on so fast that actually it's sort of become the title. The plan is to build a railway test centre, um, a fully purpose built test centre, and we're going to build it in South Wales. Um, it is actually going to be unique in many of its characteristics, and I shall explain to you all about that in a minute. Uh, we've got funding from both Welsh Government and UK Government via Bays for some, um, probably about half the build. Uh, we will need to go to the market for more. Um, Welsh Government's purpose on life for this isn't really about a railway, it's about economic development in South Wales, because as this coal mine closes, and it's uh, been a coal mine in this area for 200 years, then actually uh, the local area is fairly depressed already, and uh, this doesn't make it any better. So the plan is to build a £250 million pound project uh, railway. Um, the site that we actually have actually bought, so the site is now in ownership of the GCRE, um, it's actually over seven, 650 hectares, it's nearly 700 hectares, which is bigger than Hyde Park, it's actually bigger than Gibraltar um, and Heathrow Airport and all sorts of places put together, really. Um, so it's an old coal mine. We're planning to make it an open access process, so basically anybody can come along and use it. We're going to try and build it as a net zero railway, and I shall try and explain what that's all about. Um, but the purpose is to test new technologies, innovations, uh, and enable them to be certified right up to full approval for use, uh, both in the UK and abroad. Um, and actually, I need to explain how we're going to do that. So there will be three core facilities here. There's an infrastructure test loop, and this is about infrastructure testing, uh, rolling stock testing, which is actually what everybody else does, but the infrastructure testing will be unique. Uh, and then we're going to provide storage sidings, et cetera, for trains, maintenance, and the primary purpose of that is it's good at OPEX money. It brings the uh, money in and it keeps the lights on. Um, there'll be loads of auxiliary, auxiliary type um, uh, services available at the site, including all sorts of things like a hotel. Um, and actually, in the next couple of months, we'll be seeking the uh, little gap in the funding that we have. But um, I'll, I'll move on because there's lots to tell you. So where are we? Uh, we're in Devies, Wales. Um, as you can see, it's sort of... Uh, um, South Wales, just above uh, Swansea um, and Neath area. So if I can, I don't know if you can see this, uh, whoops. Um, but the little red dot there, that's actually on Fluen. Uh, there's there's um, an old coal mine that, that Helen has been there and the site is literally this whole area uh, around here. So it's really quite um, substantial, um, I think. Actually, that bit there is, oops, that bit round there is really the site. Um, so uh, a, a large site. Um, it has to be to accommodate the whole railway. 
um, we we have quite a clear vision of what the need is. I mean, as my previous role as CTO of Network Rail, I was running the R&D for Network Rail and indeed I was chair of TLG, the technology leadership group for the whole industry. And we've been spending some time looking for uh, better test facilities, particularly infrastructure test facilities. Um, so, that, so that actually all of the test facilities in Europe, um, Melton, uh, RIDC Melton up in uh, Leicestershire, Wildenrath in Germany, Vellum in Czech Republic, they're, all, they're actually all full of rolling stock. Um, and hilariously, Network Rail can't, I couldn't get access to Melton to do my testing. Um, so, you know, there is a need, there is a shortage of this, and in particular around infrastructure. Um, there is government support to this because after Brexit, it's sort of a question of how does the UK mobilise itself to sell and export to the world. Um, we we have always had thing to something to contribute to railway industry in the world. Um, we should do more. Um, and rail is a real industry. I'm talking to the uh, converted here. Of course, we are a, we are a proper industry, um, and we do contribute to the economy of the country. Um, and I say. South Wales, quite depressed in some respects, particularly with coal going away. Um, so there's obviously lots of things to do. So Welsh Government are supporting us. Um, there's lots of industries support uh, for this process. And probably the most important thing we've got here is full planning consent. Amazingly, we have Port Talbot, Neath councils and powers councils have actually fully approved this programme. Um, that's quite an amazing thing because every time I tried this over the last 20 years, we'd always fail because of planning permission. Uh, so actually we're off and away. Uh, the site itself, I'd say seven, 650 hectares or so, actually over here on the left hand side is the last of the um, open cast coal mine. It actually started over here in the east and over 60 odd years it's gone over there. Prior to that, it was a deep, car, deep, deep mines um, scattered somewhere over here and somewhere down here. This area to the sort of southeast is what's currently the coal washery for the mine. Um, it's where the coal was brought to. Um, it was clean, prepared for transport. And this is the um, what was the Brecon Neath line. Uh, it actually ends here, but this line is still open, goes down to um, to Neath and joins the Great Western Main Line. It's been pulling coal out for a very long time. The plan is to convert this area into a uh, reception sidings, storage sidings. There'll be a, a sort of control room, HQ if you want to call it that, uh, here. Um, there'll be a hotel here around the research centre uh, and the idea is that um, we can bring trains in, uh, store them here and then bring them up onto the loops around here and what we what you can see is an inner loop which is the infrastructure test loop. Uh, I'll just explain the characteristics in a, a couple of slides and an outer loop that is the sort of rolling stock test loop. Um, and what you can see is there's quite a lot of cutting uh, on the inner loop and quite a big embankment on the outer loop. Now, what I'm going to try and do is show you a video next. So um, hopefully you can see this, but this is a section of the earth. Um, I shall try and get this uh, thing to run. Um, I'm just struggling with his how to make the damn thing run. So come on. Uh, you need to take laser pointer off. Yeah, OK. Maybe that will do it. Ah, well done. Um, so hopefully you can see this, but this is a sort of 3D rendering of the site. Um, and one of the things that you immediately notice is that it's not flat. Actually, there's quite a lot of hill here. 
Um, and we're sort of looking to the south at the moment, we're spinning around the old coal mine underneath us there um, and coming around to look from the south to the north. And you can see how much inclination there is from the washery up to the um, loops themselves. That is going to provide us a little challenge um, for us, uh, but it also enables opportunity for people to test um, rolling stock, particularly on uh, steep gradients. It's actually, frankly, nearly the size of the licky. Um, so that, that's a quick video. Hopefully you uh, were able to see that. Um, I'm going to leap forward into um, more of the presentation now, but, but a bit more detail, um, how this is actually unique, um, what it's going to be in terms of a research and innovation hub, that actually it'd be more than rail. There's opportunities for automotive, there's opportunities for all sorts of other industries because the site's so large. Um, the whole energy thing is is quite a exciting opportunity, frankly, as well. Um, so a bit more diagrammatic in here um, in terms of the, the branch line coming up from the from the uh, um, from Neath there coming in. We'll reconfigure it. I mean, basically there was sidings here before because of the mine. Um, we're re-establishing uh, much of that um, uh, siding capability and building it more, the HQ storage, um, solar farms, etc., on site as well. Uh, so it's just to sort of give you a bit more of a dynamic sort of explanation of the thing. Um, we'll send through the presentation afterwards and you'll be able to uh, read it in more detail. So um, the core facilities are very much to uh, construct the outer loop to be TSI compliant. Um, maybe some of the outer loop will be compliant to NHS2 design. There'll be ETCS and, and uh, GSMR, some stations um, and lots of details in here, which I shall jump onto again. I think I think the bit that's probably most interesting for uh, colleagues on the call here is the infrastructure loop. So the plan is to to run a train round this inner loop continuously, 16 hours a day. And the plan is to put, frankly, that train is going to be a heavy train, it's going to be a freight train or a heavily loaded passenger train. And we're certainly going to try and put 20 million gross tonnes on. If we're naughty, we'll probably overload it a bit further. So we make the um, equivalent tonnage quite a bit higher. Um, the inner loop will, will have traditional network rail systems on it. Um, it's, it's designed to run, it's quite a small loop, it's designed really to put tonnage on, so it's not really about speed, it's more about tonnage. But the purpose is to load the infrastructure and actually enable testing of the infrastructure. Um, and as I say, there's a bunch of signings uh, for storage, etc. Uh, the whole site will be fully electrified, there'll be a full data centre, and in fact the whole digital twin process is going to be um, uh, enabled around the whole site and I say the link road is actually really quite steep uh, one in 50 rising to one in 37 briefly just before we get onto the loops um, which I say is um, great for testing uh, a little bit nervous in terms of there's a curve on it as well and making the uh, track stay where it is and not walk down the hill is going to be a challenge um, so a bit more detail about that um, and say there's, there's, there's quite a few test centres around Europe, um, but they test trains, they don't test infrastructure. The only place that tests infrastructure currently is the Pueblo site out in Colorado, which I and Network Rail have used in the past, um, doing a lot of work on rolling contact fatigue uh, a few years ago. Uh, we went to Pueblo because there was no other place that we could safely grow cracks in rails and understand what was going on. Um, so the whole point is to keep the train constant, just run it around all day and load the infrastructure with a realistic gross tonnage and really start being able to use it to learn the full 
asset life of infrastructure. So the opportunity to embed in this all sorts of things like composite bridges or different types of sleepers, ballast systems, rail, clearly huge. And so the outer loop, um, 110 miles per hour, uh, fast, more purpose built for, for train testing, uh, etc. So we'll, we'll move on because there's just a lot of detail. I say the, the plan for this loop is, is really to load it up and to embed. And one of the things we want to do as we build it is to embed in, in the build the innovation. So the trials of uh, different rail materials, sleepers, ballast, composites, composite overhead line systems even, uh, things that actually are quite difficult to do on the main line because of risk, both um, particularly service risk, but obviously safety risk as well. Clearly, we have a controlled situation where we can we can test these things in, well, the appropriate environment for them. Um, the infrastructure loop itself actually is quite small, um, quite tight radiuses. Um, on one side, uh, there was a balance. How big do you build this? If you make it too big, you don't get enough passes. If you make it too small, yes, it's um, it's getting too tight, isn't it? But the reality is that actually this will this is about testing the infrastructure. So this is making it quite aggressive for the infrastructure. This cur curvature here, um, say four kilometres, 25 kV. Um, and largely a sort of, uh, I suppose you'd call it a class two line, really, uh, in terms of RA910, heavy tonnage, but uh, designed to, to to test the infrastructure. The the rolling stock is, um, so so just, just to complete that, so we're going to put on some recycled um, network rail, traditional class B signaling systems, uh, traditional overhead line systems, and track some of it will be reclaimed recycled uh, material from various railways in the uk and obviously some of it will be brand new but typically it's a sort of say class two line um and the opportunity for doing some radical testing really quite exciting i think and a level crossing just for fun uh train testing the other side of it uh, cat one a so 200 kph TSI type compliant um, outer loop, uh, one clear proper full scale station, but virtual loops built into the virtual stopping built into it as well. Again, 25 kV and all the sort of standard stuff, but the opportunity to embed all sorts of um, new technologies at the same time uh, on it. Um, Moving on, uh, so the outer loop curvature quite wide on the outer loop here because obviously we're looking for more speed. Say 110 is sort of circa what we'd be able to do around the outside. Obviously, this uh, this tighter loop here is a bit more um, limiting. And um, one of the things we're having a discussion about is what sort of what sort of cant we will apply to that um, to that curvature and what the sensible. Uh, operating speeds will be but the opportunity to because it's a loop to be able to do endurance testing of trains to run them for long periods of time to put lots of uh, mileage on them uh, such that when they go on to the main line they don't actually fail on the first days of operation which is historically what um, happens in the UK quite a lot because we don't get enough mileage on the trains um, before they go into service and so just a quick word on the loop, the, the link road here has to go up quite a dramatic gradient on onto the, to the, to the loops. Um, that in itself can be uh, and will be a test facility in itself for the rolling stock, um, parking brakes, acceleration braking on the steep hill. Um, actually, rolling stock engineers quite like that challenge. Um, so it's very much again a ETCS level two system, um, a more compliant TSI uh, over line system, and again track more compliant because essentially we're testing the train, not the infrastructure this side. Um, 
but the opportunity to embed parts of a HS2 design are possible, not obviously to test speed for HS2, but more to test transitions from slab to ballast, um, point designs, uh, all, all the paraphernalia that goes with um, uh, a slab tracked railway, you know, can we actually get the fixings and fastings to last for any serious amount of time? I think there's opportunities for HS2 to, to, to do some of that testing. Um, moving on, one of the things that this facility gives us the opportunity to do is that if we, it'll be configured so we can do a sort of figure of eight. So you can go from the outer loop, run around the inner loop, back to the outer loop, into the inner loop. What that does is actually gives the opportunity to test um, the outer loop at being, let's say, ETCS um, of a design that's very much looking like HS2, so going on to a traditional Class B system that's on the inner loop. Um, and so what you've got that is four transitions on one figure of eight loop. You will get four transitions in and out of ETCS on a dynamic railway. That actually gets you or gets an opportunity to replicate the transition between HS2 at um, Stafford um, crew in the Stafford crew area um, four years, five years before they can do it uh, in real life. Um, given that um, history shows that Crossrail to Thameslink to all sorts have had huge integration issues of those systems, um, the opportunity of doing it sometime in advance has got to be good for the railway, hasn't it? Um, I should have mentioned that the outer loop will be European gauged as well. So we're going to gauge loading gauge wise, part of the siding, the loop, the link road, the outer loop to European gauge such that we can test European trains. Um, it will be, it'd have to be brought up by road, um, but the road system is suitable. Uh, that's not a problem. They've been pulling out coal from here for donkey's years. So the, the road system is more than competent for doing that. Um, I mentioned research and innovation. Um, Birmingham University has just actually two days ago made an application for a second UK Ukraine grant. That's the UK research, uh, railway research innovation network. Um, there was a grant provided in 2017-18 uh, to Birmingham, South, Southampton, Huddersfield as the leaders. Um, they've now made a second grant, which applies for 30 million of um, government funding and a match of 60 million from suppliers. That has actually just gone in and those numbers have been achieved um, to enable a centre of excellence for testing and innovation. So it's this is about high TRL testing as opposed to the previous grants that were more research and uh, lower TRL focus. Um, the University of Birmingham and actually now uh, Swansea and Cardiff have joined the Ukraine process, as well as the Southamptons and Huddersfields, of course. Um, and there will be a research laboratory on site that will accom accommodate up to 60 uh, researchers. Um, and the opportunity for obviously those researchers, researchers to link um, research in the laboratory with real life testing is obviously a, a huge opportunity here. Um, and um, one of the things that we're also hoping to attract is Innovate UK, UK RI type monies to enable um, that more high TRL testing. And Bayes have already provided a grant of 8 million. Uh, and in fact, in the next few weeks, I think it's the 3rd of November, um, there will be a launch of a competition um, for uh, innovation on the UK, on, on the GCRE here. Um, and it's sort of two phases. One phase, first make a bid for um, very much the sort of feasibility study of the possibility of uh, anything from a composite bridge, composite over line, uh, different types of sleepers, construction, stabilisation of embankments, etc. Um, all that will will uh, be in there. And then the second phase is build it. 
actually you can build an insert into the into the uh, GCRE that innovation. And that's the big difference between today where a lot of these research programs get a, awarded and the first thing to do is ring up Network Rail and Network Rail says, you what? Um, well, you can have access in anything up to a year's time uh, because that's that's how the process works. Um, and of course, they just burn most of the money uh, trying to get that access. With this process, the errant access is guaranteed. Um, and we hope that will change the, the opportunity for faster, um, faster testing, faster innovation, um, and faster certification into service. Because taking five years from an idea to getting it sort of tested and available for use, it's got to be two years, it's got to be 18 months. Um, and so that's really a key tenant of this facility to, to do so. Um, just moving on, we've got the power of the site. Obviously, it's 25 kV. We're trying to make it net zero. Uh, around the site are, is already a very large wind farm. There's a 25 megawatt wind farm next door. Um, the opportunity of the site is so big that um, more wind farms, there's actually planning permission applications in for two more wind farms. Um, and the possibility of solar um, could well give us enough power to run this thing off grid uh, with some sort of uh, private wire into the to the wind farms. Um, and then we could, with some sort of storage, we could actually operate this directly off the renewables. There's a, some technical challenges to achieve in that, but that's the purpose of the centre. Uh, hydrogen also um, on site to test hydrogen trains, but the the observation I'd make is that actually putting a fuel cell in a train is is what the people are all doing today and they're making good progress with it. It's relatively a doable thing. All trains are electric, really, even the diesel. Um, so conversing them is not so difficult. But the problem is managing the hydrogen. How the infrastructure for hydrogen is a significant issue. Do you do you pressurize it? Do you liquefy it? Um, there's, and, and then how do you pump it into the trains without fossilizing all the metals? Um, you know, a non-trivial issue to be resolved. And we're talking large quantities of hydrogen when, you, when the railways get started with this. Um, so testing of the infrastructure for hydrogen, quite an important thing. Um, and obviously the whole cycle of batteries and all those other renewables there as well. But the site is an innovation site. So the opportunity to do that sort of thing, large. Um, so our objectives is really we're trying to run a safe site. Our principle will be to exclude people from the site while we're testing. So, um, so if something goes horribly wrong, then nobody gets hurt. There's a bit of a mess, of course. Um, obviously, something we don't want to do, but the reality is no, there's nobody risked in that process. Um, we're trying to build in as much as we can. Uh, in terms of the build at the moment, so we can future proof the site. Uh, obviously, quite a challenge to build it um, uh, at the lowest possible cost and not to bring in large quantities of materials to the site. So, we're trying to recycle the materials on the site. As it's an old coal mine, it's a brownfield site, it's largely shales, uh, a little bit of sandstone, and basically, it's largely residual sites. And the Geotech engineers have had a great time um, trying to work out how uh, how well it will consolidate, how stable the site will be, and we've actually been we've done two trial embankments already of different designs to look at how we can stabilise that. Um, we want to provide a value-added service for our customers to be flexible, to actually be able to do this in a timely manner, um, to enable people to be able to get in and test easily, uh, quickly, and deliver um, results as a res um, from the whole thing. Um, just a quick bit about timelines. The site has been purchased, so we actually own a 700 hectare coal mine. Uh, the earthworks are starting very shortly in terms of the sidings. We probably won't, well, depends on the weather, we'll get some done this year, 
but we but once you get to December through to March, it's just too wet. Uh, there's two metres of rainfall on this site a year, so um, we probably won't get too much done during the real heavy bits of winter. But then we'll get going properly on the earthworks uh, in uh, the, the spring next year, actually building into the loops um, and getting the sort of trace sorted. Uh, that will happen mostly next summer. Um, and we hope the sidings, the first tranche of the sidings being built on the old washery site, relatively easy to do, will be available from next year. And the plan is to be fully operational by um, second quarter of 2025. Quite an ambitious uh, thing to achieve um, because we are moving 3 million cubic metres of soil, creating some cuttings that are 20 metres deep on the inner loop and creating a 35 metre embankment partly on the outer loop. Um, uh, so a non-trivial challenge being built on the hill. Um, it's it's not in one sense the ideal place, but actually it is the ideal place for testing railways. Because you can build it here, you can make it work here, you can make it work anywhere pretty well. Um, so so that's a quick tour of um, of the the GCRE. I hope you've um, uh, found it interesting, and I'm sure you'll have some questions. Um, happy happy to discuss that. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Tony. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andy. I thought I was really interested in myself. Um, I don't think we've got anything in the chat just yet, but we'll give them a few minutes to to put any thoughts in there. But just listen to it myself and just listen to you talk about the amount of rainfall that you've got going on down <laughs> on that site, and, and it kind of <laughs> mirrors some of the challenges that I see in my day to day working on on earthworks and drainage schemes. Um, Obviously, you mentioned quite a good bit about the earthworks. Is there any sort of aspiration or intention to do any testing of drainage on that site? Possibly? Uh, absolutely. Go on. Absolutely, uh, Tony. Um, and one of the things we're doing is talking to Network Rail at the moment because uh, Julian Harms, uh, Mona, uh, and and Co are all very interested to embed whether it's monitoring systems, because we have the opportunity of monitoring the large embankment from the inside out and not just from the outside in. So yeah. we can, we, there's lots of um, opportunities to do things differently. There's obviously lots of opportunities to look at, at the actual drainage systems themselves and, and look at how that works, how it doesn't work, what, what are the opportunities for the future. You're absolutely right. And if anybody's got any ideas, suggestions, um, research programs that they would actually like and think could be beneficial to the site we're happy to talk about that because we could potentially embed them now um Brilliant. so so absolutely uh um when so i talk about the rain that instance, Andy, I, I forgot to mention the wind by the way yeah. <laughs> we've got a very big southwest facing um hill and and that front face is really really windy uh particularly in winter so so um, actually testing, sort because of, we'll have to put some noise bums in and noise um, attenuation of some sorts. And we will look at, I was looking at the spec of this, actually it's going to be quite tough to find a noise barrier that will actually survive it, apart from a bund. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, like you said, if you can if you can build it here, yeah, you can probably build it most places, particularly in the UK. Um, so in, yeah. if people have got any ideas, like you mentioned, it, your contact on the screen there now, is that is that the first port of call? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, my my details are there. I'm happy to talk. Um, I, I saw in the chat there it's just some questions. So we, we have, have about half the funding. Um, the equation is, and the rules around this is that Network Rail can't fund the building of this. That that's outside their regulatory regulatory settlement. They're not allowed to do that, but they are allowed to use it. So Network Rail has a, in currently CP6, a £247 million R&D programme. Um, its, its intention is to become an anchor tenant of the site and basically move a lot of its R&D here because it struggles to do R&D on the main lines with all you know, green zone, red zone access limitations. 
uh, rightly so, but that means it's quite difficult for researchers to access. So what happens? We're in inevitably using, as best we can, heritage sites, heritage railways, um, laboratories. We're not necessarily doing the high tonnage realistic testing. And this is trying to add to that, that purpose. So network rail is, is very keen to, to come onto the site. And frankly, so is Transport for Wales, Transport for London. Um, many are, are seeking to come in. Um, and they and they will provide, if you like, OPEX income for us. Right. So hopefully that, that thing will all help to sort of free up product approval and, and yeah. hopefully expedite that and, process. And exactly that. It's, and... it's about moving the product approval of some things onto this site. Not necessarily everything. We're, we're not trying to um, capture the world. We're, we're trying to um, uh, do our bit to add those holes that are currently in the railway system for testing. Yeah. It ties in with a, with a question that Rami's asked in in the chat, really, like the, who who are you who are your clients that you're thinking about? Obviously, you've mentioned Network Rail. Have you had any engagement with any other potential end users? Yeah, so so we are talking to HS2, we are talking to HS1, we are talking to Transport for Wales, Transport for London, and the European Commission and the what's called the ERJU, the Europe's Rail JU, which is taken over from Shifter Rail in Europe. We're talking to them. Uh, there's a little issue obviously in terms of British government and European Union and their relationship <laughs> but actually they can and, and whether that's a shared process and how that works with their horizon programs in terms of research but actually contracting the site to them is not a problem um, so so you've got the infrastructure managers on one side the big suppliers we're talking to as well from the Siemens to Alstom's to uh, frankly, all the large uh, suppliers of uh, systems and then rolling stock suppliers. And in fact, some European rolling stock suppliers are actually talking to us uh, because they find it difficult to get access into Bellum and uh, Bildenrath. Um, and we're trying to persuade them that they'd like to come to the UK. And of course, if they do come here, they're bringing money into the UK, which is actually good for our economy, uh, which we rather need at this moment because um, government's not doing a wonderful job at this moment on that. Absolutely, yeah. On that sort of topic, we've got one from Gareth asking if there's just a separate funding pot to improve the existing rail link to on on the win. <laughs> to on I'll let you read that yes. one. <laughs> yeah, the need to on the win line is currently um, traditional freight, uh, lightly, I say lightly used, coal use. So it's RA9 slash 10. Um, and theoretically W6A, but I don't think a W6A train has ever run on it in the last 25 years. Um, so we're trying to just get it gauged. Probably isn't an issue with gauging because there's only two structures on it. 11 miles and no structures is quite incredible, or two structures. Uh, it's level crossings that are the biggest issue uh, for us. Um, so we are um, steaming away with that. Uh, you know, discussions with Network Rail about the usage of the line because, frankly, there is no other usage for it other than us. Frankly, if we weren't there, I, I think the line would be closing, frankly. Um, so, yes, a, a significant discussion about the line, how, how that will be done, um, and clearly Network Rail has quite a lot of interest in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Matthew's asked a question again quite similar in, in, in nature. So in terms of the materials coming to site, thinking about the sustainability and environment piece, yeah. are you trying to do the bulk by rail delivery? Is that is that feasible? If we can, we would love to. Um, in fact, in fact, I can't see any other way of getting a long welded rail in. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually the sheer quantity of uh, sleepers and ballast that we need. Um, no, we don't want to bring that in by road. Uh, we, we do want to bring it in by rail. Um, there are some and and actually the logistics are getting through the burrows because there's sort of a reverse into the burrows and then up the branch line um in principle it can be done um an interesting discussion uh, but the great thing about railways are we're an innovative bunch so we'll find a way of doing it <laughs> Brilliant. Um, this question that sakesh has asked here as well was, was one i was thinking of myself um have you got any plans for driverless train testing ah yes 
Well, one of the things I want to do is actually automate the inner loop. I'd like to run that train automated around that loop because then there is no driver. Mm. Um, and, and that actually reduces the risk further and we can obviously explore more in, 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 in terms of um, allowing cracks to grow and understand propagation rates and all that sort of um, interesting science. So yeah. does that mean that we need a full SIL4 automation system? No, it doesn't. Um, so it could range from uh, nicking the auto driver system out of a Tesla <laughs> and putting it on the train to a full Thameslink type ATO system. But it, yes, it's the answer. Yeah, um, yeah. Opportunities for that. So, uh, um, I've got so many questions landing in here, Andy, at the moment. Well, keep, um, keep. Uh, Chris wants to know, and it's a good point as well. Are there any worries about the subsidence, given the history of, of mining on that location? Yeah, I mean, we'd be fools to say there's no worries. Um, all the deep level mines were capped off um, some years ago. Um, and we've done quite a lot of geotech surveys. We've had boreholes drilled over the th whole thing. It's a bit like a Swiss cheese. Um, and we don't believe there's any San Andreas faults, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but are there holes? Are there possibilities of um, subsidence? Yes, there are. Um, and, and so extensive amounts of surveying has been done to uh, to try and cover that risk, but it frankly it is a risk. Yeah. And the second risk is, the second question for us is how much subsidence will there be? How much settlement will there be on this material? Um, and that's, that's obviously a non-trivial question and quite an important issue because we're putting a railway on top of it. Um, Hilariously, it gets us to the same place that Network Rail's got with lots of its embankments quite quickly. <laughs> Why are you maintaining a, a, a you know, poorly supported substructures? Yeah. Um, so on one side, it gives us replication of that. On the other, it's a it's a clearly a cost and risk issue. Uh, that's why we've done two trial embankments already to look at consolidation methods of consolidation. We're also looking at some of this um, electrolysis type systems where you can dewater embankments. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we think that would be probably quite prudent for us to actually be able to dewater as we go, because then we can probably build the embankment a bit quicker. If we have to wait for the water to drain out, we'll, it'll be slower. So, you know, you're absolutely right. These, these are actually interesting challenges. Um, and um, if you like, it's 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 almost part of the innovation that we've got to solve the challenges just to build a place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of monitoring the track asset, James was, was wondering if you're doing that traditionally or, or looking at a lot of automated monitoring. Well, both, I think, is is the way we're going to do it. Um, we're going to put a full fiber system around the loops such that we can connect so because being a test physicist, you want to be able to connect everything to it, but but it sort of does the twin purpose of enabling us to put base monitoring monitoring system in, so that we know what we're, what our asset is doing, and then secondly to enable innovative monitoring monitoring systems to come along and be overlaid on top of that to test, verify, and prove that they are actually as good or better than the traditional systems. So, absolutely both, and and actually that's one of the things that. We would expect people to in the in the calls that we're this Bayes call that's coming out in third of November. We're we're hoping that we'll get some proposals in that that will be funded um, by Bayes. There may be other ways of doing that. The opportunities, say Network Rail is quite interested in doing some some things in the same area, and we're actually looking to use their R and D to fund to do some of that. But if there's other companies who've got an interest in it, we're interested to talk. Fantastic. Um, I've got another one here from from Gary asking about uh, nuclear power. Um, we'd heard a year or so back that they were potentially being looked at for research and power source. Is this still something on the agenda or or in the future? Um, we this site 
we've we've looked at all sorts of alternative power sources for ourselves. We looked at thermal energy from the ground, but because the coal mines have been capped off and they are very, very old, it's considered uh, everybody's concluded it's just too dangerous to even think about trying to use that thermal um, that thermal energy because those deep mines we just can't get to them and they're capped yeah. off and probably polluted and um, messed up shall we say by the uh, open open cast we say the wind the solar are all on the table um, we haven't gone quite as far as nuclear yet but um, uh, <laughs> but uh, Never personally, say you know uh, I think you know, actually, mankind's got to think quite carefully about what it's going to do. Nuclear's on one side, carbon free, but not without risk. So these fusion devices that are being developed are actually quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure that they're actually any less risky, but uh, but but at the moment, nuclear's not on our list. <laughs> I've got a really good question here for Maria, if you've got time, Andy. Um, yeah. Have you planned to embed any track bed innovation research and development and what this means for its constructability to serve such research and monitoring in terms of intelligent sensors, transitions and any new products? Absolutely. Um, we would love to embed um, some of that into this. Um, I'm sort of hoping that part of the loop will be recycled traditional network so we can make it look like a sort of network rail circa 30 year old network rail main line but then another part of that loop should be brand new it should be everything from mh rails and bonetic steels maybe to composite sleepers to all sorts of you know i i'm still challenging the idea why do we have a oblong sleeper i mean because it comes out of a tree but if we're making it out of composites or everything why why do we we don't actually have to have the same shapes. We can change the shape such that it would be, and, and lots of people have done some initial work on that. And there's been some um, tests down at Southampton of different shapes. And I know the Dutch have done quite a lot of work in this area. Why can't we be doing some more? Because this is about the ballast to sleeper interface. Can we make it kinder to the ballast? Um, all, all those good things, you know, how do we replicate um, a wooden sleeper in a concrete sleeper without you know so we get the better better performance um that we that uh, certainly the trains like and uh, you know, absolutely we'd love to embed those sort of things in you know deep ballast low ballast retained ballast well, that's it yeah on your earthworks you know you could be using geo cell geo cells to build that up micropiling yeah. geopolymer yeah. injections all this stuff that's flying around so, at the moment so the short answer is yes We'd love to do uh, anything that's sensible in there. We'd like to embed some of that testing as we go. And that's the purpose of the time. So say we anticipate that you run continuously uh, 16 hours a day, 10 days, 10 weeks. And then we have a sort of deliberate two week possession period where you can change out material track, whatever points. And then you run again for 10 weeks. And then again, you've got two weeks sort of downtime. So it's a very deliberate process to do that. Now, obviously, some testing like rail and sleepers is actually going to last much longer than 10 weeks. It's going to be perhaps years. Mm. Um, but other things will we'd want to take them in, put them in, take them out, all those sort of things. So so we've designed the site such that it does that because you've got to have access to put these things in, whether it's just a monitoring system, whether it's a new POE equipment for the point, you know, You've got to allow that process, and we have. So bring it on as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I yeah. do have some colleagues who are sort of terrified that I'm the kitty in the sweet shop and I'm going to run out of, they're going to run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, this is this is our opportunity as a railway, and particularly P-Way, you know, we've got to be thinking about these things, got to be trying to find the better solutions you know we're all trying to do it let's do more yeah it's a, it's a great opportunity you've got there Andy I mean there's a, there's a lot of people in the chat um you know off, offering their support and and they've got products that they'd like to you know potentially try during the build up and, and I mean I guess like we said I, before I get, on, get in touch with yourself yeah my email's there so 
email me. Let you know, let's have a chat about some of these things. Uh, we may have may already be doing it, we may not be doing it, and we may have the opportunity to incorporate it in some way. So the door's open for that discussion. Fantastic. Um, if there's anyone who wants to turn the microphone on and ask a question rather than relying on me to pick it out of this this huge selection that I've got here, um, I think we've covered <laughs> the base on a lot of them. But if Andy's yeah, got time, I'm happy to open the floor. Longitudinal sleepers, yeah, why not? <laughs> I, I would love to put some slab in um, and do the transitions. Um, transitions are the bane of our lives, isn't it? You know, um, and uh, soft to hard embankment to bridge all sorts of things you know we we know all the areas i want to replicate some of those and enable us to be able to do the testing of solutions and of the monitoring system so you know absolutely we want to do that fantastic um i think i think we're all about out of that there um so i think all that remains is, is for me to thank andy for his time and for his excellent presentation that, it's really kind of captured the imagination of everyone we've got on here. We had a really, really good attendance as well. So fantastic. Uh, thanks so very much, Andy. I will send you the presentation. Oh, lots of clapping. <laughs> I will send you the presentation. I'll I'll sort of. Um, I'll, I'll change it slightly so there's a link to the video rather than trying to send the video because the video is too big. Yeah. So I'll send okay. you a link to the video and you can run it yourselves um and and we'll do it that way uh, otherwise i won't get it to you all right that'd be great that'd be brilliant um so the only, the only other thing i've got to do then is talk about our next meeting um which will be sam urin of slc rail and that'll be an in-person meeting held at the slc offices in brindley place and that's on thursday the 10th of november so hope to hope to see a lot of you there um but for today thanks everyone for for your attendance and your great questions and, and thanks again andy really enjoyed that Okay, thank you. Thank you for Cheers. listening.